1 Samuel, we're getting out of the book of Judges here, 1 Samuel chapter 10, read verses 6 and 7, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, my task here today is to set us up for God's word for life, is to make sure that we uh, are reminded that, that God will speak into our lives, and when he does, if we do what he asks us to do, he'll confirm what he has said to us. I don't know about you guys, but like I can, I can hear something, but sometimes I have lots of doubts, and it's nice when things come alongside of what I've heard or what I've been shown to kind of reinforce that and address some of those doubts, and so we need to make sure that we're getting help from our godly leaders when we have trouble understanding God's will in our lives, so that's what my goal is here today. I'm not sneaking up on you. First Samuel chapter 10, we're just going to read two verses of scripture, and I'll fill in lots of blanks as we go. So this is where Saul, the first king of Israel, is being anointed by Samuel, who was the last judge in Israel. He was also kind of operated like a prophet and a priest. He did a lot of things for the children of Israel, but he is anointing their first king, King Saul. And in verse 6, he's talking about how God will come along and confirm this calling. And one of the things he says will happen is, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. I've anointed you. This is a sign that's going to confirm God's call in your life. And you will prophesy with them, and here's a cool thing, and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You guys can be seated today. I'm going to do my best to teach on cracking the code to our calling. Cracking the code to our calling. Before I dig into the lesson today, I want to draw your attention to our church calendar. We have Momentum coming up. That is in the month of July. It's the 16th through the 19th. So it'll begin on the evening of the 16th. That's a Sunday. And it will begin, it'll end on the evening of the 19th. Um, in the district calendar and in our church calendar, it said that it was going to be at the Double Tree Hotel in Burlington. Astronomically expensive. Unbelievably expensive. And so it's actually going to be at the Catalyst Church. And so you guys can start planning for that. You know, we've got lots of things coming up. Singles, conferences, ladies conferences. Um, But I'll say it on the camera in case any district board member wants to listen. I'm on the district board too. Momentum should be the priority. I think they all should be a priority, but the priority. It is the time when everybody gets together. Um, I take my calling to try to reach the loss very seriously. So I try to get out there in society and rub elbows with people of all creeds, cultures, nations, whatever. But it's wonderful when you can go to Momentum and spend three days and a half just with people of like precious faith. It is so energizing. Part of the early church, right? The fellowship is very, very important. And so if you have any questions, let me know. But I kind of wanted to put that plug out there so you can't say you didn't know it was coming. It's been on the church calendar. You know where it is. If you want to drive back and forth, it's not that far. It's probably 40 minutes. That's nothing living up here. And um, if you don't, there's all sorts of Airbnbs around there. I checked this last week. And it's pretty inexpensive if you team up with somebody else. So please be there. Have you guys ever thought in your relationship with God, like if you would just tell me what you want me to do, like I would do anything. You ever been there before? Like, I'm trying to serve God, and I'm not exactly sure what you want me to. I've literally said this in my prayer before. I don't know if you guys have. Would you just, like, like speak to me? You know, I don't know if you speak like some actor, like with a deep voice, or you speak soft. I don't know. But if you would just say, Jason, get off of your knees and go three streets down, you know, take a right, knock on the fourth door, and say this, and a miracle would happen. I would do that. Would you guys? But has that ever happened to you? That's never happened to me either. But we go to the church services often, right? And we hear people talk about God wanting us to be a part of his family. That's in the Bible. We're all members individually. Jacob has a part that only he can play. Same with Roger. Roger has a part that only he can play in the family of God. And so we sit there hearing these things. But so often we're like, but I have no idea what it is. Like, I believe what the Bible says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am unique. There are things only I can do that nobody else can do. The problem is, oftentimes, I have no idea what those things are. 
so we hear these things. In today's lesson, we really want to hone in on a couple of things that can help us kind of crack the code to our calling. If we understand these things, we can start hearing some of those messages. I think sometimes God's sending messages and we're just not picking up on them. You ever thought about that before? You're trying to give somebody a hint, you know? I've had that happen before. You know, did you, uh, did, did you uh, wake up and not take a shower before you left the, your house this morning? Like, no, no. I, 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 you know. Someone's trying to say you don't smell very good, you know? Or did you lose your comb? Oh, I know exactly where my comb is. Like, they're trying to say your hair is a mess, you know? And so sometimes I think God's trying to send us some messages, but if we aren't doing certain things in our life, they can go whew, right over our heads. So digging right in at the very beginning, you ever, anybody ever heard of, of uh, I've got a picture of it right up here, but a, a decoder ring? You ever heard of a decoder ring before? They've been a part of all sorts of like books and shows, but there actually are decoder rings. And the way you use a decoder ring, you can pull this ring out, and what happens is before you have the ring, it can look like all you're looking at is a random set of numbers or symbols. It doesn't make any sense, right? Different symbols, different numbers. You look at it and you're like, this is just a bunch of numbers. But when you have the ring, you can turn to the right number. Like up there, 22 is a T, apparently. And so all of a sudden, something that was random and made no sense at all, if you have the ring, now all of a sudden, it can make all the sense in the world. Did you get both of my slides up there, Cody? Yes. Hey, can you turn to that second one there? Let's practice for a second here. So we've got 14, 33, 96, right? Means absolutely nothing. What is that 14, 33, 96? Means nothing. But if you have a key beneath it, we go to 14 up here. Anybody find 14? G. G. Great. Now find 33. O. Oh, and now find 96. G. So what is 14, 30, 33, 96 spell? R. Right. So without the key, it's just 14, 33, 96. 96. But if you add the code, now all of a sudden it makes complete sense and it's fairly simple. So today in our lesson, we start off, does anybody know how Samuel kind of came to be? What was his backstory? Does anybody know anything about Samuel? He's the prophet who anointed King Saul in our text. So Hannah, right? Cool, right? I think you can spell her name backwards and it's still the same, right? It doesn't fit with our lesson at all, but it just popped into my head, so I shared it with you, right? Spell Hannah backwards, still spells Hannah, right? So she, right, she couldn't have any children. And, and she comes onto the scene really being accused of being a drunk, yeah. right? She's at the temple and she's just opening up completely, like pouring her heart out. She wanted to be a mom and she couldn't have children. And so the, the, the priest, Eli, comes up and he sees this lady in the temple just beside herself. And he's like, lady, how dare you come into the house of God wasted? Yeah. Now, this was a thing, right? When people would come for pilgrimage feasts, they would have these big parties. And it isn't like they had like an expiration date on the grape juice. Right. Sometimes it could get fermented. People are drinking this stuff at these parties, and sometimes they could get a little messed up. And so Eli, apparently the priest, had experience with this. So he sees this lady, and immediately he's like, you've been drinking too much of the, the grape juice that's gotten silly, and you came into the temple like this. But she turned around and said, no, I'm just beside myself because I want a child so bad. And while she's explaining this, she says, you know, if God would just give me a child, I'll give my child back to God. And it's at that moment, Eli's like, now God is going to answer your prayer. Yeah. You know, think about that for a second. We can learn something from that as well, can't we, church? Yeah. You know, how many things have you asked God for, have you said, if you give them to me, I will give them right back to you? Most of the things we ask God for, we want right. yeah. for ourselves. Yeah, right. I would like a raise at my job. Yeah. I would like my friend to treat me nicer and better. I would like my car to stop breaking down, you know, but, but usually it isn't I would like my car to stop breaking down so I could give more people a ride to church. I would like a raise because God, I would like to support a missionary to go to Brazil or wherever. But as soon as this lady put her desire in the context of fulfilling God's will, now all of a sudden God started answering prayers. 
So maybe some of our prayers would start getting answered if we started directing our attention toward the Lord and saying, this is really all about you. This prayer that I'm praying, it's not about me. It's about doing something or getting something that I can give back to you. And so she says this to Eli, Eli, you're going you're to have a child. And so sure enough, she does have a child. And when he was old enough to be away from his mom, she brings him to the temple. And, and this was actually pretty common back then. If parents couldn't feed their kids and they were going to starve, a lot of times they brought them to the temple because people would bring food to the temple. It was part of their culture. We read about that in the books of the law. If you're reading with the mission through the Bible, they would bring food. So there was food at the temple. And so parents would bring their children and kind of leave them there. And these kids would do the work of the temple, clean things up. They would run errands for the priests in exchange for a place to sleep and food in their bellies. And this was Samuel's life from the time that he was little. He's working around the temple. This was not a celebrity, right? He was not the prince of the temple. Eli had his own kids, the priest did, the high priest. And so he, he spends his life cleaning up until one night he hears God calling to him, calls out his name. What did he do? He hopped up and went to the priest, right? Eli, you called for me. Eli's like, no, I didn't. Go back to bed, man. How many of you like getting woke up in the middle of the night, right? Yeah. I mean, some of you had to do it when your kids were little and maybe when they're not little, but you don't like it, right? And so he, he comes back again. Samuel goes back to bed, comes, hears the call, comes back to Eli a second time. Same deal. You know, he's like, what are you doing? I heard you call. No, I didn't. Goes back. Third time, he comes back, wakes him up again. Eli, stop it. But then it finally clicked in Eli's head. He's like, you know what you're hearing is not me, dude. I told you already. What you're hearing is God is calling to you. Right? God's been saying, you, you, did you lose your hairbrush? No, what are you talking about? They're trying to say your hair's messed up, man. He was literally calling Samuel out, but it was going right over his head. Thankfully, God had put a man in Samuel's life that, that could recognize that it's God who's actually calling for you. This is why it's important if we are going some things, we only hear from the leadership that God has placed in our lives. How does God speak to us? Anybody think of anything? Through the Word of God. Anybody think of any scripture? Oh boy. Let me give you an easy one. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? Yes. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the people of God can be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God speaks to us through his word. Yes. Is there any other way? Roger, you got your hand up. How else does God speak to us? If it answers the question, So what spoke to him? Renee, your hand's popping up there. Um, through the Spirit of Christ, through the Holy Ghost. So there you go. The Spirit definitely speaks to us. Can anybody think of a verse? <laughs> People are being brave. They're starting to throw some stuff out there. How, how about John chapter 14, verse 26, when Jesus said, there's going to be a helper. The Holy Spirit whom I'm going to send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to us through his spirit. Can anybody think of anything else? Through We got preachers in ministry. Absolutely. We're going to get to that one last. You guys are jumping right to the end. Anybody think of it? Bob, your hand's up. 
I'm only going to take a couple more. Yeah, I was going to say a still small voice. Okay, well, that could be the spirit, I guess. The Bible, the Word, prayer, that's, that's really this opening up our, the channel to the Spirit to speak to us. Jacob. I don't know the verse, but it talks, the Bible talks about how like, everything in nature speaks to us. Psalm 19, 1 and 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Nature points us to God. How about circumstances? Yeah. Yeah. Situations. God can speak to us through situations before I was afflicted, I went astray. That's what the psalmist said. But now I keep your word. You are good. You do good. Teach me your statutes. Circumstances can teach us things that sometimes we would never learn without them. And of course, what most people have said, which is what I'm getting at here, is sometimes we only hear from God through the leadership that he has placed in our lives. There are many, there are many verses for that, but I want to read you Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. I know I'm going fast, but you guys have a video. So for everybody who's getting carpal tunnel right now trying to keep up with me, Cody will post the video probably by tomorrow and you guys can keep up. But in Romans chapter 12, it says, having then gifts, this is talking about our leadership, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Our leaders, if you're supposed to prophesy, if that's your gift, then prophesy in proportion to your faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches... In teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who sows mercy with cheerfulness. Samuel only heard God's call. He was able to crack the code in this particular situation. It wasn't a tree or nature. In this particular situation, the Spirit of God was speaking to him. Literally, he could hear it. But that didn't work this time. It went right over his head. He was able to crack the code because there was a leader in his life that had enough experience to say, hang on a second. God is trying to speak to you. So this next time God calls out, tell him I'm hearing you, God. Tell me what you want me to do. And from that moment on, God began to speak through Samuel. It blessed the entire nation. The Bible says the word of God was rare in those days. They weren't used to hearing. So because Samuel had somebody that could help him recognize what was happening, God began to speak to his people again. This is one of my favorite things as a leader in the church. is not when I stand up here and deliver the word, but when I can help you discovering when God is speaking to you. Eli, later on, you can read it, I don't have time today, he benefited from hearing the word of the, God, of the Lord through Samuel. You see, if I help you hear a call from God or one of your leaders does, you know one of the, the, the greatest things that ends up happening? You end up helping me. God helps you to develop into what you were supposed to be, and now all of a sudden I'm benefiting from what God is doing through you. It's this wonderful relate. Let me help you so you can... It's the way this works in a body, in a family. Now, i got to stop here for a second. Myself as a leader, if I'm trying to work with somebody and it doesn't go well, I'm the biggest critic you'll ever find on myself. Like, if I work with you and your whole life falls apart, I really like to blame myself. Okay? That's, I like to do. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm saying that's what I like to do. Okay, I worked with Sister Griggs and she just fell apart. It's my fault. I like to do that. And I think on some level, there's wisdom in that. You need to take a look at yourself and try to see, could I have done something better? However, does anybody know anything about Eli's boys? Yeah, Sister Jackie, they were wicked, weren't they? There were certain ways that they brought food and certain ways that it was supposed to be prepared and eaten. And they kept saying, no, we're not doing it that way. I want to make it the way I like it. The Bible says they were sexually immoral with women who were coming to, to, to worship coming themselves, coming with their families. These were wicked people. So Samuel is under Eli's protection and leadership. Eli's boys are under Eli's leadership and protection and direction. Samuel becomes an amazing prophet of God, judge, operated as a priest as well with sacrifices. Eli's boys end up dying in battle. God judges the way that they behaved, representing him, same leader, two completely different directions they end up in. Church, I think it's, it's good to expect your leaders to live godly, 
and to do the very best that they can to lead us. But at the end of the day, you are going to succeed or fail based on our ability to follow the calling of God. If you are not living for the Lord well, maybe I've made it more difficult for you, but it's not my fault. If you're doing well, it's not my fault. It's because you decided to do what God wanted you to do. And so things are going well. And so one of the ways we crack this code to our calling is making sure we have godly leaders in our life. And when they do have something to say to us, we've got to do our best to try to listen to that. Because at the end of the day, you can have a great leader. Who was Satan's leader when he fell from heaven? Tell me Satan didn't have the best leader there ever has been and ever will be. And he ended up being the devil. He ended up being the devil. But God was his leader. He was in heaven. He was an angel. And he failed. And so cracking this code, I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to be very picky about who my leaders are. But when I find them, because it's godly, it's biblical that we have them, I'm going to work with them. I'm going to communicate with them. You know, talking to people all day about God and their calling, it gives you a unique perspective on things. And so your leader isn't smarter than you. Your leader has a different set of experiences than you do. And so it's vital that they are part of cracking this code. And so Samuel grows up to be this great prophet. And there comes a time when God wants to, or he did, the people wanted a king. And God got upset. Anybody know why? He wanted to be their king. God's like, I was raising up judges to speak through them because I want to be your leader. But the people were like, no, we want a king like other people have. Samuel's mad now too. God, they don't want you. And God's finally like, you know what? If they want it, give them what they want, which is so much like God, isn't it? If you've tried living for God for any length of of time, you're going to find out sometimes you do dumb stuff. Sometimes I do dumb stuff. God gives us so much, and then every once in a while, I just decide, I know what the Word of God says, but I'm going this way, even though it says to go that way, you know? And, and, and sometimes I wish God would just stop me, you know? Grab the back of my jacket or whatever. It's like, no, no, you're not going that way. But God doesn't operate that way. He allows us to have free will. And so finally, God's like, okay, Samuel, if they want to have another king, go ahead and let them. And so Samuel's hanging out one day, And this really tall, handsome dude from a poor family, tribe of Benjamin, the least in the tribe. His family's like, this sounds like Gideon, doesn't it? You know, the least in his family. And a poor dude with no name comes up to Samuel and he's he's like, I'm looking for my father's donkeys. Now, if you're interviewing people for kings, okay, the dude's poor. He comes from a poor family. Probably not really educated. What are you doing exactly? I'm on the hunt for my father's donkeys. That doesn't scream king to me, you know? But it's interesting that from this encounter, God makes it clear, Samuel, this is the guy that I want to be king over Israel. So Samuel came into his calling doing what? Let's go back. What was he doing? He was basically... Basically a janitor, right? God called the orphan janitor. And then who's going to be the king? The poor guy looking for donkeys. Yeah. But my point is, Bob, a lot of times the road to someplace special is mundane. The way to greatness in God is not usually parades and fireworks. God usually looks for the person cleaning the temple. Jacob, the person mopping the floors. Ben, he's not up here. The person mopping the floors when nobody is here. The person who's out looking for... If I was solid, then like, look, this is what my life has come to. How many times have you said that? Right, when we're four, we're all going to be president or Superman or a doctor or a baseball player or a queen or a princess, right? That's what we're all going to be. I didn't want to be a princess when I was four, but I was just trying to, you know, ladies, ladies, the ladies that were in here, or a queen. But that's what it is, you know? And how many times have you been not four years old and looked around and thought, I'm changing tires? 
This is what I'm doing with my life. I'm bagging groceries. This is what I'm doing right now. I'm mopping a floor, right? I was going to be the king of the universe, and now I'm mopping floors. And a lot of times, especially in society today, people feel like they are too good to do those types of jobs. And so they would rather not work than do something that they consider beneath them. And that happens in the church sometimes too. Pastor, I want to be involved. Unfortunately, this is what I got for you to do. Okay, I'll think about it. That means... They're not going to do it. I'll let you know. Here's the big one. I'll pray about it. See, some of y'all have used that before. I have too. You know, I'll pray about it. Okay, they're not going to do it. Okay, see you next year, you know. But if we're going to crack this code, not only do we need godly leaders speaking into our lives, but we have to recommit ourselves to doing whatever your hand finds to do. Do it with all your might. I don't think there's anybody in here that can't do something with this day. Something with this day. The road to our calling. Saul became king. He became anointed king looking for donkeys. I wonder how many great things God could have revealed to us if we'd recommit ourselves to looking for donkeys. If we'd recommit ourselves to mopping some floors to doing the dirty work, to doing the things that seem like a waste of our life, those are the times that God often shows up and and uses other people to say, you're the one. Why do you think that Samuel kept going back to Eli and saying, I heard you call me? He didn't know God's voice for him. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Conjecture. It's on the video. I wonder if God used a voice that sounded exactly like Eli to teach Samuel something. Samuel knew what Eli, he didn't know what God's voice sounded like, but he knew what Eli's, he'd heard Eli's voice his entire life. I wonder if God used Eli's voice to call Samuel to show Samuel something. When you have a real godly leader in your life, if they're in the book, when they speak, you are hearing from Why would he keep going? He knew what Eli's voice, but he kept going back. Why? I conjecture. I think God used a voice exactly like Eli's to keep calling him out. He, it, it, it would send him to his leader who could help him identify his calling. And so we see it repeated itself again. Saul had no idea what God wanted for him until he got around the judge. Samuel pointed it out. But like all of us, you guys, he had doubts. And so Saul immediately got scared. I wonder if you aren't scared with what you feel like God wants you to do, do you think most of the time you're really hearing from God? If you thought God called and you're not scared, you're not nervous, do you think a lot of times you're actually hearing from the Lord? Probably not, right? When God calls us into his work, it's always going to require more than what I can possibly give or do. And so we're, part of cracking this code is learning to expect that anxiousness, the anxiety, the fear, the the self-doubt, because he's going to say, okay, you're used to looking for donkeys. What I've got planned for you is not looking for donkeys. You're used to sweeping floors. This next step, though, is going to put you in a place you are so far in over your head. But when God calls us, He's calling us into something that is going to require his help to accomplish. And so we have to learn to deal with that anxiety. Because I think a lot of times, church, in this church, when I deal with us, a lot of times it isn't that we don't have any idea of what God wants us to do. But we're having a hard time dealing with the anxiety or the fear or the self-doubt that comes along with being called into something by God. And so what he did was, yeah, fear of failure... 
He heard from his godly leader. Saul did. He anointed him. But what Samuel said is he's like, when you actually step out into your calling, God will do things to show you that you're on the right track. But you don't get them until you're willing to answer the call and do what God has asked you. And then as soon as you do that, all of a sudden, God will show up and start... De- God is... He's not intimidated by your fear or your anxiety. And he's not mad about it. He made us emotional people. He knows you're emotional. He knows that I am. And so he can deal with that. But he can't deal with it if we don't use our free will to say, I will step into what you're calling me to do. Yeah. There are people in this church that haven't made progress in Christ in a long time. We come to church. We go to Bible study. But when was the last time you let God get into your life and cause you to take a step forward? And so there are many of us that we hear about callings and we want to be a part of the family. And some of us start feeling like we're not so much a part of the church. And it's, uh, we want to point to Eli. And God's looking and saying, the people who are doing well in the church have the same leader that you do. And your leader's not perfect. None of your leaders are perfect. But, but they're doing a good enough job where some people are growing in Christ and the church is moving forward. It's a call to us to own our lives once again and say, if I'm not moving forward, it's because I'm not moving forward. And so we find here this anointing and he had all these issues and all these fears, but because he was willing to say, I'm scared that the prophet said, if you will step into this There's three things God is going to have come into your life. The first thing is people are going to come up and say, you don't have to look for the donkeys anymore. They're actually home. And and, and not only that, when when you're on your way home, because they were out of food, it's like these three men are going to come up, they're going to offer you food. And then he said the third thing, you're going to come across some prophets. This is where our text was. And he's like, the spirit of God is going to hit you in a way you're going to seem like a totally different person you will have gone to a different level a different place and you're going to start prophesying with the prophets and people are going to look at you and they're not going to say isn't that the tall handsome guy from the poor family from the small tribe of benjamin who's who goes out looking for donkeys they're now going to look at you and say saul is now he's one of the prophets he's different And soon all sorts of chaos started breaking out in Israel and it caused the people to rally behind him. And he was able to step into his calling because he realized sometimes I need some help recognizing this. That sometimes I don't hear the call or I don't step into the call until I I do the mundane tasks. That that I have to learn fear or anxiety or self-doubt comes along with the calling of God because it's too big for me to do alone. But that when we will step out anyway, God will come alongside of us and he'll minister to our fears. But it all requires us taking that first step. And so I would encourage you to use your church to help you to grow in Christ. Don't ask them to to say, oh, you're afraid, never mind then. Ask them to say, I feel like God wants me to do something, I'm scared out of my mind. Will you encourage me to move forward? I read a long time ago in a John Maxwell book, we'll close here, I just looked at the clock and I'm three minutes late. He was talking about the power of encouragement, and I don't know why they do this. Who would even want to do this? But they were measuring how long people could stand in cold water. Like, who cares, right? Is that going to, like, I guess maybe it could save your life if you fell off the side of a boat or something. But they were trying to measure resiliency, and so they put people in this water, and they had an average about a number of times. People would stand in this before they couldn't take it anymore, and they jumped out of the ice water. And then the second group of people that they brought in to measure, they changed one thing. They had somebody standing next to them encouraging them that they could stay longer. And on an average, the people with encouragement stayed in the bucket of water twice as long as the people who didn't have any encouragement. And God's trying to say, I've given you leaders, let them encourage you. But don't let the, oh, it is so cold, hop out, get out of the cold water. Are you uncomfortable? Get out. No, let them encourage you to say, God's calling you into something. It's uncomfortable? 
okay, I get uncomfortable too, but if God called you, you can absolutely do it. He hasn't called me yet. Well, are you sweeping floors? No, I'm too good for stuff. Well, then maybe that's why he hasn't called you yet. Let's get ourselves around people who won't give us excuses not to move forward, who will encourage us to dig deeper and to grow. So what we need to do with today's lesson, as I, I'm just going to be done, is at some point either today or this week, this lesson needs to get from our head to our heart. Because the church is listening to me right now, but you do not have the right spirit collectively to live what I'm teaching you right now. It's in here, but it's not making it into here. And I'll tell you this right now. There's a lot of things I know to do in my life. But the areas I struggle mostly aren't things I don't know about. They're things I'm not doing. I know to do it, but I'm not doing it. Do you know that sin isn't doing something bad? Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. And so at this church, I think there are some of us that we think we're not sinning because we're not dealing drugs or beating people up. But if God is trying to speak to this church and say, this is what is good, live it. And we just sit there and think, oh, that was an interesting lesson. But it never makes it from here to here. It dies here. People live beneath their calling. And this church isn't nearly as effective as, and as strong as it needs to be. We can do more than what we're doing right now. I want to hear you teaching a year from now in your Bible study, in, in your community. That's where I want to be next year. I want to be bouncing from place to place on Sundays, just out of my mind, flying around because there's so many Bible studies, and I want to be there clapping and praising and worshiping, and maybe some of you will let me teach in your Bible study one of these weeks. But that's what this church is going to be doing. One day, this group will not be together because there will be 15 churches around here. We'll get together every once in a while and rent the auditorium or something, you know, because we'll need that. But that won't happen until some of this stuff gets from here into here. From here into here. Cracking this code. There was three or four things I gave you. If you missed it, watch the video. But it's time to pray about this thing. It's time to pray about this thing. So we, we got 20 minutes about before our next service. I... I'm just going to end right here. But I hope that we dive in at prayer before service. And I hope that we're ready at the altar call. Because I really believed as I prayed this week that God would give us something special. If we would really, one of the sweeping things, one of the donkey things in church is working at the altar at the end. That's a tough mundane task sometimes. But if you go at it, that could be the place that God changes everything for you. It really can. There's still some people who've stopped it here. You can see it. But I'm going to keep coming for you because I believe that we can be way more than what we are. Way more than what we are. Let's spend some time in fellowship and we'll fire this thing back up at 5 o'clock.